have been known to enjoy a pint of Ben & Jerry's chocolate therapy ice cream every now and again. Sure, it's not the healthiest of habits, but it also might not be worth totally eradicating from my diet. An article in the New York Times argues that we need pleasure to survive, and that it may not be worth living an ascetic life just to prolong your existence a few weeks. Dr. Zeke Emanuel, who has worked as a health advisor for Presidents Obama and Biden, is quoted in that piece saying that his brother is a health nut who does all sorts of crazy stuff when he went vegan, no nightshades, none of this, none of that. How much is it going to add to your life? A few months? If it is adding time, he added, it's adding time to the end of your life. The added month you get is not today. In other words, that additional time comes in your declining years, not in your vibrant, youthful years. So why not enjoy the good stuff now? Well, that sounded pretty good to me between spoonfuls of chocolate fudge brownie ice cream. So I went on to read another essay by Dr. Emmanuel, hoping it would encourage me to cook up a few burgers for lunch too. His Atlantic piece, Why I Hope to Die at 75, caused quite a stir when it was first published in 2014. It's certainly provocative, but no, it doesn't advocate killing yourself on your 75th birthday. Don't do that. Rather, Dr. Emmanuel says, once I have lived to 75, my approach to my health care will completely change. I won't actively end End my life, but I won't try to prolong it either. After 75, if I develop cancer, I will refuse treatment. Similarly, no cardiac stress test, no pacemaker, and certainly no implantable defibrillator. Why? Well, as Dr. Emmanuel puts it, living too long is also a loss. It renders many of us, if not disabled and faltering and declining, a state that may not be worse than death, but is nonetheless deprived. It robs us of our creativity and ability to contribute to work, society, the world. It transforms how people experience us relate to us, and most important, remember us. We are no longer remembered as vibrant and engaged, but as feeble, ineffectual, even pathetic. That piece is making the rounds again after an interview Dr. Emmanuel did with the Times of London almost 10 years after his original Atlantic piece was released. Emmanuel is now 65 and still planning to deny life-saving care to himself from 75 onwards. That's despite the wishes of his partner, it seems. Quote, she would like me to consider preventative measures like a flu vaccine. A lot will depend on whether I really am a rare outlier at 75 and I'm not deceiving myself. That will be the biggest challenge. We are in discussions, says Emmanuel. Those are not discussions I would want to have with my partner. Sure, no one wants to slowly decay into a shadow of their younger self, but it's still difficult to take the mental leap that Dr. Emmanuel has. Our brains are hardwired with powerful survival instincts that tell us to live as long as possible. And I mean, are happy, vibrant octogenarians really only outliers, as Dr. Emmanuel suggests? What about the families we leave behind if we just accept the end at 75? And as Dr. Emmanuel inches closer to 75 himself, might he have a change of heart? Who better to ask than the man himself? Joining me now, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. He's the Vice Provost of Global Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania and a former Obama White House Health Policy Advisor. He was also a member of then-President-elect Joe Biden's Transition COVID Task Force. Dr. Emanuel, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a fascinating piece when I read it back in 2014. I read it now again this week, and it's still fascinating. It's thought-provoking. It's kind of morbid. Why did you write it? Because you say this is your personal view. You're not trying to evangelize. But come on, the whole point of this piece, is it not, is to get other people to think like you do and do what you plan to do. And people are confused, especially when they read the title and don't read the article. Um, I was not evangelizing. I was express, expressing my view. I want people to understand that as we age, we go through changes. Our physical body declines, our mental sharpness declines, our working memory, our cognitive function slows down. And we should think about how we want to live when those changes happen. And I was being provocative in the sense that I want people to live an examined life and examine this part of aging so that it doesn't happen to you, but you have thought through how you want to live in that situation. That is a period of time I thought a lot about. I thought about yeah. my position over 40 years. It's not something I came to lightly. I've worked on end-of-life care for the last 40 years, yeah. and I thought deeply about how I want to live when I age. 
So you were 57 when you wrote the Atlantic piece in which you said, quote, 65 will be my last colonoscopy and no screening for prostate cancer at any age. You are 65 now. Congratulations. Are you sticking to that? No colonoscopies, no cancer screenings, no rethink of the whole 75 and I'm done, even though you're 10 years away from it. Well, you said quite clearly, which is, look, I'm planning or thinking I'll be average. That's, you know, we all can't be outliers active okay. at 85. We have to think we're going to be average. And if I'm average, what I've said is what I'm going to adhere to. Now, maybe I'll be lucky and I'll be rare, one of the rare outliers. And then I'll have to re-examine that time. If I'm still able to teach, to contribute to society, to make the world a better place and yeah. enjoy myself, then you know, I'll have to re-examine it. But, but for now, principle, and I've articulated the principle. So, I'm, so are you sticking to it? No colonoscopies from this year onwards because you're 65. It's for, at 75. I, I, this is probably my last. Well, I don't have it this year, but I will have right. one soon, and that will be my last one. Okay, uh, uh, not a discussion we normally have on this show. One of your main arguments, as you mentioned, relates to outliers, um, is after we turn 75, quote, creativity, originality, and productivity are pretty much gone for the vast, vast majority of us, you say. There are examples of eight people in their 80s doing good work. You say they're outliers. I wonder, are they outliers? I mean, the president of the United States is 80 years old, wants to serve until he's 86. The woman who just vacated the speaker's office after a very successful run is 82. Her two former deputies, 82 and 83. The nation's top doctor who led the fight against the pandemic just retired aged 82. That's a lot of outliers. Wait a second. You've mentioned five people and the country has 330 million people. Do well, five very prominent people. But five people do, in the most prominent do. jobs. But hold on. Five people doing the most prominent jobs. They're not doing average jobs. If they can fill the most prominent jobs in America, I would argue that makes them more important than your average. Uh, say we have 10, 20, 30,000. Uh, if we have 30,000, that's 0.01%. Very, very small percentages. Well, very small percentages doing, I say, the job of speaker. I use those examples because they're such extreme examples. They're the most, some of the most important jobs in America. Uh, the president, for example. I mean, let's to be clear, you, if you were Joe Biden's doctor, would you tell him to stop taking his meds now, not to get any checkups? How about your mother? I believe she's a sprightly 89, God bless her. Do you tell her not to take her meds? Let me be clear, OK? You are identifying uh, an outlier in the president. And I would say that the president continues as he is. He's doing really fantastically well. Um, when my father, uh, at 89, at 92, excuse me, uh, suddenly we discovered he fell down, uh, had a brain scan, discovered that he had a brain tumor. Um, we decided uh, with him no additional treatment. Um, and it was very, very clear. Uh, he could have had chemotherapy. Let me tell you, as I wrote in another article in The Atlantic, there was a neuro-oncologist and a neurosurgeon at his yeah. bedside when I arrived from Boston in Chicago, and they were happy to give him the options of chemotherapy and surgery. So I think it's important to be very clear about what you'll do and what you won't do as you age. That was my point. I have a personal philosophy. I think my personal philosophy is a good personal philosophy. It won't so, let me uh, decline. And what I'm urging is that your uh, viewers think about how they want to age and when they have but, certain limitations, whether it's physical or yes, mental. And we should all to be clear. That's an important question. We should all think about that question. But your personal views do have kind of policy implications. You've talked about health care rash. I, no, well, well, sir. Okay, well, let me, let me put, a, let me put a quote to you. I said clearly, and yes. my actions uh, show clearly, it's a personal philosophy. When okay, but I'm let talking me, about so let me quote, let me. Medicare, I Let me read a quote to you. Out. Let me read a quote to you from your quote. You say in the Atlantic piece, you write, quote, certainly if there were to be a flu pandemic, a younger person who has yet to live a complete life ought to get the vaccine or any antiviral drugs. Now, why the binary choice? We're the richest country in the world. We spend trillions on foreign wars. Can't we provide enough flu vaccines for young and old Americans alike? We certainly had enough COVID vaccines. Uh, we started out having not enough COVID vaccines, and we had to ration them. That's exactly my point. And in COVID, 
I said very specifically, it's the old who should get it because they were most vulnerable. The principle is, who's the most vulnerable and how many life years can we save? And in COVID, I urge that the old get priority precisely because they were the most vulnerable. In a flu pandemic, as I use data, uh, and you didn't quote the full uh, point, it's most likely that young people under 18 are going to be more severely hit, and they should get priority. I'm willing to defend both those positions because I've been consistent on the principle, which you're not identifying. The principle is who has the highest burden of death, which is irreversible. And when it's old people, as in COVID, I have urged that they get priority. And I have been consistent on that, so, because, so on that's that note, the policy, because that's the policy implication, not my personal view. Got it. So These on that note, different here. on that note, I know you're vehemently anti-euthanasia and anti-assisted suicide. Conservatives smeared you as Dr. Death back during the Obamacare death panels nonsense over a decade ago. You've made very clear that you don't plan to end your life at 75. But if your argument is that life is so bad after 75 that you'd reject basic medical treatments for illnesses, some people might wonder, what is the point of living at all beyond 75? Oh, I, th I think there are other things to do than to ask someone else to end my life and implicate them in my own uh, uh, death. And there's plenty of things that I can do myself uh, if it became that bad. And that's very important for me to think through. I have, you know, I, I understand that if it is painful, and I can't get relief from it. I can't get. I can't contribute. Uh, I'm physically disabled or some other uh, uh, situation. If I had all those combinations, you know, I don't have to ask someone else and implicate someone else in that situation. I'd also have to be sure that I wasn't depressed or had other uh, uh, reasons that could be reversed. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, we will have to leave it there. Fascinating conversation. I wish you a healthy decade ahead. Thank you very much. I hope to be active. We'll see you back when you're 75.